thank you for joining us. Wendy, Mark, how are you guys doing today? Great. And Les Shapiro. Uh, so there's three of us here today to take you on. It took, it took three of us to actually take you on, Drew. Drew, if you don't mind, I, I want to read the quote from your column yesterday, okay? Um, okay. Here it is. It's time to, and, and let's all keep in mind that Drew writes for a Detroit newspaper. It's time to admit that the Lions have an aging core. Calvin Johnson has become a possession receiver against Minnesota. He never once had that field-stretching play that defined his career. Middle linebacker Stephen Tullock is slowing down through two games. Defensive tackle Haloti Nada is only a shell of his former Pro Bowl playing self. It's finally time to admit these Lions already have reached their competitive ceiling. They're much closer to another dramatic personnel rebuild than they are to a long playoff run. Drew, are you getting a lot of hate mail in Detroit these days? Guys, I always get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it wouldn't be a usual day without getting a, number, getting a lot of hate mail. From, from Detroit fans saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to be a Detroit column. How come you're trashing our team? You're supposed to be trashing the other guys. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the Lions are, you know, they're not the laughing stock they once were. But it's, it's kind of worse for Lions fans, though, because now they've been teasing people, thinking that they could be a pretty good team. And what we saw from the first two games is that, ooh, okay, those question marks that they had are becoming exclamation points now. That they, they got some serious holes there. Well, yes, uh, we, we realized the offensive line hadn't been any good. They lost two valuable defensive players. Uh, you bring up Calvin Johnson, who's only sporadically appearing to be the guy who's Megatron, uh, what happened so quickly to a team that was, a, A, a playoff team, and B, was a team on the rise? Well, you had a very good defense a year ago. They had a top five defense. They ranked number one in the NFL in rushing, and they lost their top three defensive tackles. Dominican Sue, Nick Fairley, and C.J. Mosley. Now, the, the Lions are trying to reinvent the wheel. They're making people in, in Detroit think that, look, we can, you know, Teams all the, all the time, are, there's always a big changeover in teams. But rarely do you see good teams have a 60% turnover in their starting offensive line from one year to the next, and they lose their top three defensive tackles from a team that ranked very high in defense the previous year. Rarely you see good teams do that and still start off well. They're struggling in the trenches, and this is, this is what they're, the biggest issue right now. The best way to evaluate or the easiest way to evaluate any game for me in a quarterback in a quarterbacking league is to evaluate the quarterbacks. Given the Denver defense, given Stafford's health, what are the chances that Matt, Matthew Stafford has a better game this Sunday than Peyton Manning? Well, it's always a possibility because you know the NFL stands for no freaking logic. Because the Lions <laughs> should lose this game. They should lose this game. But guys, having having spent my entire life in Detroit. And watch the Detroit Lions for all these years. I can. I'm fairly confident they will probably beat Denver Sunday night. Really? The, the Broncos Sunday night because you know why? Because that is how the NFL works. If the Lions go 0 and 3, they're probably going to be a 4 and 12 team. If they lose this game, their home opener, then you, you're going to see this team fall quickly, quickly, and you're going to see a season, you know, you know, go to hell quite quickly. But. If you win this game, then they're back on track to being a 7-9, 8-18, which is what they really are. But it will, it will fool people in Detroit and around the NFL into thinking that, okay, you know what, those first two games were just an aberration. These were the real Detroit Lions. But uh, can Matthew Stafford outplay Peyton Manning in this situation at home with his bruised ribs the way that they are? Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Well, Drew, paint the picture. How do the Lions beat the Broncos? Well, how you, you beat them is that your, your defensive line, uh, the, the key player, and this player returned to, to practice today for the Lions was Ziggy Onside, defensive end. One of the more underrated, I think, defensive ends in the NFL. If you're able to put pressure on Manning, if you're able, and, you know, he's been hit a lot in the first two days, as much as Matthew Stafford has. You, if, if you're able to be disruptive to him, you can create some mistakes. You can create some problems. And the Lions, I think, are going to be playing with a lot of emotion coming into this game. Their home opener, the crowd's going to be loud, national TV. And it's, it's typical. The country is going to be waiting for the Lions to, to collapse. They're going to be waiting for them to, to bury them. You know, and, and NBC is going to be covering the game. This is their last stand. So I expect them to play with some pride and a sense of purpose. If they can't do it, 
if, if they can't produce a, a pretty good effort Sunday night considering everything that's against them, and if they lose the Broncos, then you're looking at the bottom falling out and this team winds up being 4-12 and or 5-11. and So if, if you believe in that, in that pride can, and emotion can, can try to sway things from, from, from that standpoint, then yeah, the Lions, that's how the Lions can pull this off. But you have to keep Matthew Stafford upright. Miller and DeMarcus Ware are salivating, salivating at the prospect <laughs> of going after a quarterback <laughs> with sensitive ribs. <laughs> I could just picture them now at practice today uh, getting salad, saliva Wearing bibs. Oh, yeah, yeah, bibs and and I, I would back tank. up a couple of things, Drew. I remember and was there, and you've been around forever like I have here. Yeah. Uh, I came in with a Denver Broncos team. <laughs> And, and the Lions were just the, the scourges of the NFL. They were just the most terrible team. They had Champ Bailey's brother. They had Boss at the time, if I remember correctly. Right. And they just kicked right. the Broncos' butts there. So I would back you up that because I would add the other aspect of it is that Sunday night football, since NBC started it, has never been to Detroit. So I think that gives another yeah. element that exists there. I, I've got to ask you a question, though, that uh, Jim Caldwell – was with Peyton Manning. Uh, he's been a great, great defensive coach in this league. He led the. Uh, he was the coach when the uh, when Manning's group uh, almost went through the season undefeated and basically didn't play the last two right. games. But right. he got fired. He got fired there. He went back and became a, a, a coordinator again and did a successful job. Is he getting any of the heat for for this or? Because he's such a nice guy and a good coach, is he a Wade Phillips type, or is he a guy who can come back and be successful in this league? Well, and he's getting a fair amount of heat. His offensive coordinator, Joe Lombardi, who happens to be Vince Lombardi's grandson, is getting the bulk of the heat. And there are people saying that Caldwell needs to take over the offensive play calling and because they think the offensive has been a little too conservative. But Caldwell is the right coach for what this team needed. Jim Schwartz, the predecessor, was a manic. He was just crazy at times, you know, and when he got high strung, the team got high strung. And that's a big reason why I think they lost a lot of fourth quarter games under Schwartz. Uh, Jim Caldwell brought a calming influence. And when you're starting 0 and 2, when you got even your, your staunch supporters locally and nationally, even, uh, we thought this team had capable of big things, they're starting to question you. You don't need a head coach who's going to panic. You need a head coach who's going to stay cool. And that's what Jim Caldwell. He's the perfect mindset, the perfect mentality for what this team needs right now. But having said that, you know, if they lose Sunday, if, if they look terrible and <coughs> lose Sunday, then you're going to start the countdown clock when the, the next line coach is probably going to be fired. You know, because if you, lose, you start 0-3, all of a sudden people in Detroit are going to start considering, okay, who's going to be up there in the top five picks in the draft come next April? There you go. That be the main football story around here. Drew, uh, Drew Woody brought this up earlier in the show. And so I want to ask you, was Gary Kubiak ever seriously in, in the mix for the head coaching job there? He was considered. Uh, I do believe uh, whether he was brought in for a formal interview, I am not sure, but I know his name was, was, was bandied about by the, uh, by the higher-ups in the Lions organization. I mean, the two top two candidates, the top candidate, uh, they offered the job to the guy from, ten, from Tennessee, in t- Tennessee job. Um, I forget his name right now, their head coach now. But he turned him down to take the Titans. Job Butch Jones. Butch, yeah, Butch Jones. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that would have been an interesting <laughs> choice. Going, yeah, since college coaches work so well in the pros, as we've seen with Chip Kelly, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that that would have been a great choice. But I, a, a final question, which is, I, I've asked this of a couple of guys from Detroit myself this week, but uh, are you more excited about the Red Wings game with the uh, avalanche that will be played outdoors at Coors Field or the alumni game between Chris Draper and Claude Lemieux the night before? Oh, be the alumni game. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? you be the alumni game. <laughs> uh, I want to see Chris Osgood and, and Patrick Watt get into it at mid-ice. I, I want to, I, 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 that's why I'm saying I don't really care about, I mean, there's no rivalry between the two teams. They're in different conferences now, but that rivalry still lives on from the yeah, 1990s. So that's, one of, that's one of the great rivalries in sport over the last 20 years. You take like a five-year period there. Wings in the Avs, that was just pure drama. It was just excellent. And, hey, pure, and pure entertainment, yeah. too. Drew, yeah, a, uh, no hate mail from us. We love you. Thanks for coming on the show.
right. Take care, guys. Uh, Drew Sharp, columnist at the uh, Detroit Free Press, and all of our guests are brought to you by Papa John's. Go to papajohns.com right now.